Hi everyone, welcome back. So we're reading the book, Other Words for Home. We are now on part four and the title of this section of the book is called Hoping, chapter one. It is early in the morning and the sun has not yet fully risen. I am sitting at the kitchen table. The sputtery smell of blueberry muffins that are baking wafts through the kitchen. I love these mornings with Aunt Michelle. We don't always talk. Sometimes we just listen to the quiet French music she likes. Flip through the newspaper together, be together. Today though, I have a mission. My pencil hovers above the paper. It is not that I have forgotten how to write in Arabic, but sometimes my hand needs to wake up to it again. This is my fifth letter to Fatima. She has not written back once. I try to tell myself it is because she is busy, because she has always been more of a talker than a writer. I don't let myself think about the other possibilities, the scary reasons for why I haven't heard from her. In my letters, I have told her about America, about the creaky old house I live in, about Mrs. Ravenswood's ESL class, about the boy in my math class who always wears space shirts and has messy brown hair. But this letter is different. In this letter, I am telling her about Issa and how we don't know where he is or if he's okay. I am begging for Fatima to answer me because I've convinced myself that if she can tell me some happy news from back home, everything will be okay. If she tells me something happy, I will be able to believe that somehow Isa is happy too, that he is safe. That is so impressive, Aunt Michelle says. What, I ask, looking up from the lined page of notebook paper, that you can write in two languages. I wish Sarah knew how to speak Arabic, I shrug. In America, I have picked up a habit of shrugging. I don't write that well in English, I say, because I don't know what to say about Sarah. I never know what to say about Sarah. Aunt Michelle slides down into the seat beside me. She smells like sugar and flour. I wish your uncle would teach her, but he hasn't. I still don't know what to say. I press the point of my pencil into the paper. He seems busy, is all I manage. Aunt Michelle gives me a sad smile. I think it's more than that, but she doesn't say anything else. I think again of that Arabic proverb, he cannot give what he does not have. Aunt Michelle gets up to check on the muffins and I go back to writing to Fatima. I end my letter with telling her about the school play. Can you believe it? My American school has a play that I can try out for. Do you think I should try out? I wish you were here. We could do it together. I miss doing everything together. Chapter 2 I'm with Mama at the doctor's office and we are holding our breath as the ultrasound technician squeezes gel out over Mama's round stomach and then presses the wand against it. The green overhead lights up a tangle of gray and black shadows that at first don't look like anything, but then if you squint your eyes just right, you see a foot, a hand, a mouth. You see life. The room explodes with a sound like the gallop of horse feet. It is the sound of one tiny loud miracle. Do you want to know what you're having? The technician asks Mama. Mama turns to me. Her English has been getting better from the lessons she's been taking at the mosque, but it still is not so good. Aren't I having a baby? Mama says to me in Arabic. I laugh. The woman looks at me, confused. I tell her what Mama said, a shy smile on my face. This woman laughs, and this makes Mama smile wide. She has made an American laugh. Back home, Mama always made us laugh. She wasn't funny in the way Issa was. Issa's funny is like an elephant, impossible to miss. You know when he wants to make you laugh. But Mama's funny is more like a cat, slinking around, hiding out in corners, brushing up on you by surprise. Mama, with her perfectly wrapped scarf, her clean nails, her gentle way of walking on the ground does not seem like she would have a sharp tongue, which makes the fact she is funny even funnier. I can tell this ultrasound technician did not expect Mama to be funny. 
I think she did not know what to expect from us at all, but she smiles and asks, does she want to know if the baby is a boy or a girl? I know she likes us more than she thought she would. I translate for mama, even though the wet look in her eyes lets me know she already understood. Mama nods and the woman presses the wand back down on mama's stomach. She says she thinks she knows, but just wants to take just one more look to be sure. It is important to be certain about these things, she says. The wand moves in circles on mama's tummy and I go back to holding my breath. As I thought, the technician says, smiling, another little girl. Bint, I confirm to mama. Her eyes spill over, tears running down her cheeks that have grown fuller in the months we have been here. Pressure builds behind my eyes, too. Mama grabs my hands, squeezes. I'd almost forgotten that it's possible to cry because of happiness. Chapter three. I hold Mama's hand as we walk out of the hospital. We are both in a daze, the word bent on our lips, tasting like chocolate tasting like afternoon mint tea with three extra spoonfuls of sugar, tasting like sunshine, tasting like hope. The lobby of the hospital is decorated for Christmas, a large tree glistening with lights, branches with pine cones draped across the nurses' desks. Jingle bells plays over the speakers, a song that I had not heard until two weeks ago, but I now know every single word, and I don't think I'll forget any of them. There is so much happiness and cheer, and for a moment, I feel that Mama and I are part of it, too. It feels like a party we were invited to, not one that we are watching through a window. But then, right as we are walking out of the hospital doors, a woman stops us. Hey, she says, pointing a finger at Mama's face. Hey! She repeats the word like a stone thrown. You don't have to wear that anymore. The cold air from outside hisses in through the half open door and it no longer feels festive. Her finger moves from Mama's face to point to her head, to her hijab. You're in America now, you're free. Mama does not say anything. She grips my hand. The woman looks from Mama to me and back at Mama. Do you speak English? The snake of fear uncoils in my stomach. I am frozen for a moment, and then I urge Mama through the door, squeezing past the woman, stepping closer to the outside, to the cold. As I pass the woman, my shoulder inches from her chest. I say, excuse us, thank you, we are happy. I do not know why I say that. My English words are all mumbled, and I'm not sure she heard me or that she understood but I wanted her to understand that we're happy here, even if we don't look like what she thinks of as happy. Outside, sleet is falling from the sky. Mama has not let go of my hand. We are happy, I say again, whispering it into the cold air, saying it to Mama, to the baby, to the baby girl who will be born here, but who is loved on both sides of the ocean. We are. Mama says, and there are new tears in her eyes. Chapter four. It is winter break and I do not have school for two whole weeks. I am planning to use all my free time to pick out a monologue for my play audition and then practice it over and over again. Why don't they call it Christmas break? I ask Aunt Michelle one morning when I am sitting in the kitchen eating the almond flour pancakes with cacao nibs she has made. I had never heard of a cacao nib before Aunt Michelle. Cacao nibs, I have learned, are a healthier version of a chocolate chip. A little less delicious, but I pretend to love them because it makes Aunt Michelle happy. Aunt Michelle laughs at my question and adds more berries to my plate. I'm amazed that even though the ground outside is frozen solid, we are able to eat as many berries as we want. Because, Habibti, Aunt Michelle has recently started calling me that, it is an Arabic word that she has heard Uncle Mazin say over and over. There is something funny about hearing that word come out of her mouth. There is something lovely about it. There are other holidays this time of year too, like Hanukkah and Kwanzaa. 
I nod, and I am about to ask more questions about these holidays that I have never heard of, when my cousin Sarah comes clomping into the kitchen, her fuzzy pink slippers pounding against the tile. Sarah walks with purpose, like she is not afraid of being heard. She has that same American boldness that I have seen advertised on billboards, like the restaurant down the street that brags about their fully loaded special that comes with everything, but really only includes peppers, onions, and cheese. I've decided it is very American to have the audacity to claim that three things add up to everything. Sarah's black hair, the only part of her that clearly came from my uncle, is tangled with sleep and she yawns as Aunt Michelle puts, pushes a plate in front of her. She cranes to look out backyard. Good, she says, it snowed. She forks a piece of pancake into her mouth and makes a face. Can't you ever make normal pancakes, Mom? Aunt Michelle cast me a smile, and I feel like we are sharing a secret since I helped her pick out the almond flour recipe, helped her count out the cacao nibs. Can you drop me off at Mount Storm Park later? Aunt Michelle pauses, the faucet still on, dripping water onto the dirty pancake skillet. You're going sledding? Sarah nods, and in between bites mumbles the names of her friends altogether. Mina Harbor Sloan. As if they are one inseparable unit. Sure, Aunt Michelle tosses the dish towel that is seasonally patterned with snowflakes over her shoulder. Mama never used to change the decor simply because the weather did, but Aunt Michelle seems to rearrange the whole house just because of the stir thermostat. Sarah stands up and Aunt Michelle says, Jude should go with you. And I know from the tone of her voice, it is a command, not a suggestion. I am expecting Sarah to push back, to argue, to clomp, clomp, clomp her slippers all over the floor. But instead, she says, okay, with a shrug and then turns to me and says, just don't be weird. I know I should feel stung, but the sound of the thrilling okay is so much louder in my head than weird. Chapter 5 before I know it, I am riding in Aunt Michelle's car up, 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 a steep hill to Mount Storm Park. I am bundled in a coat that I have borrowed from Sarah because Aunt Michelle said that my new beautiful coat was not warm enough for sledding. The coat is powder blue and puffy and so warm that I am sweating by the time we get to the park. We wave goodbye to Aunt Michelle and as we walk over to Sarah's friends, she says again, don't be weird. And then she adds, like your friend is. I know she is talking about Layla, and a metallic taste gathers in my mouth, a warning. I feign ignorance and ask, which friend? Um, Sarah says. She tugs on the ends of her hat, which looks like a wool bonnet, but somehow still seems stylish. The one who wears... Layla? I say. What is so... I pause, then try the decidedly American word, weird about her. Sarah waves at Harper, who has just jumped out of her mom's shiny silver minivan, and says, she just acts like she isn't from here, you know? All that warmth that had built up in me during the car ride rushes out of my body, and I shiver inside the blue puffy coat. But... I think in my mind floods with all those thoughts that I try my best to keep at bay, that are like wolves in the night howling that I am not from here, that I don't belong here, that I will never belong here. Layla's American is all I mean to say. She was born here, I add because I can't help myself. She's American. But Sarah is already walking toward Harper, toward Mina, toward Sloan and I am trudging behind her trying to figure out how not to act weird, trying to figure out how to belong. Chapter six. We are on the top of the tallest hill and Sarah Mina Harper Sloan are talking about tryouts for the school play. And I'm planning to just listen, but then something inside of me kicks, an impulse that I have buried and thought I left on the other side of the Atlantic. I was at that meeting too, I spit out. Sarah gives me a look and I know it is a warning. 
Mina says, are you thinking of trying out? But the way she says it does not sound like a question, more like a joke. Layla worked on the sets last year, I say, and I know my English words are difficult to understand because when I get nervous, my accent gets thicker. And I also think the fact that my feet are freezing is not helping matters. It is hard to think in two languages when your feet are freezing. Another warning glare from Sarah, who is sitting on her sled impatiently waiting to glide down the hill. But I can tell she is nervous to leave her weird cousin with her friends. I want to work on the sets, Harper offers. Harper reminds me of Auntie Amal, agreeable and friendly. Who is Layla? She's in eighth grade, I say. We don't know many eighth graders, Mina says. Is she the one that Sloan asks but does not finish? Sarah is looking at me to answer. Layla is the one who worked on the sets, I say. That impulse kick, kick, kicking inside of me, urging me to remember who I was. Not a girl who held her tongue, but Jude, who was always told Sketty. A girl who promised her older brother she would be brave. I look out at the snowy hills that are glistening in the afternoon light, and I think about how badly I wish my older brother were here. How badly I need to know that someday I'm going to have the chance to tell him about the day I went sledding with four Americans. Missing Issa has become a physical ache inside of me that is rotting like a cavity, growing more painful every day. Everyone stares at me in silence until finally Mina and then Sarah, followed by Sloan, volunteer that they are planning to try out. But they all downplay their chances, talking about how seventh graders never get cast in actual speaking roles and definitely never get any of the parts with singing solos, except for a girl named Abigail last year who got one and this year she'll probably get a lead role. I'm going to try out. I say, making sure my English is as precise and clear as it can be so that they can understand me perfectly. Sarah's eyes meet mine, but I meet hers back like I am daring her to slide down the hill that I have already gone down. Chapter 7 You can't try out, Layla says, as the steam from the bowl of lentil soup wafts up to her face. Her mother has ladled us two big bowls of soup, convinced that the lemon in the broth will stave off all the winter viruses going around. We don't want you to lose your voice before your tryout, Layla's mom says to me, because even she has heard the news. Everyone has heard the news, except for Mama, because I don't know how to tell her. My mom isn't mad about it, Layla says, spooning hot soup into her mouth and swallowing with a slurp. Her swallow is a big fat period at the end of her sentence, a declaration. She just thinks it's strange because, you know, you, there is a long break. I have learned Americans love, you know, love to say, you know, and then stop talking. They force you to fill in the hard parts, the things they are not brave enough to say. I shake my head and think of that baby that is growing inside of Mama's belly that kicks and kicks just like the spirit inside of me has once again started to kick and kick. She doesn't need to know now, which is what I say when I mean I'm not sure she would understand, and I don't want to upset her when she has that baby inside of her. But also, I'm not going to say, you know, and make you fill in all the tough stuff. Layla tears a piece of pita bread in half and then tells me all of the other reasons she thinks I shouldn't try out. You don't speak English, she says. I frown, and in perfect, thank you very much, English, I say back, I do too. You know what I mean, she says again, and this time I say, no, I do not know. You're going to have to tell me. So she tells me that my English is good, but it isn't like native speaker English good. And the tryouts are so competitive, even kids who haven't been acting for years don't get a part. And can I even sing? And what will I use as my monologue? Can I even memorize something in English? So many questions, so many doubts. When I don't say anything, she frowns. I'm not trying to be mean, I'm trying to be realistic. Layla, I say, and I hardly ever say her name. 
so that catches her attention. I left home. I flew across an ocean. My brother is missing in the middle of a war zone. What is there left to be afraid of? She gives me that look again, the one that makes me feel like there is something behind me, something around the corner. There is always something to be afraid of, she insists, and I know she is right. I know more than she thinks I do, but still I say, I'm choosing not to be afraid. I say it more for me, more for Issa than for Layla. The prayers, the words are a wish, a prayer. I lean forward, putting my elbows on the table, the way I used to watch Baba do, the way I watched Issa do. The way people do when they want to make sure you see them, that you know they're claiming their space. The way people do when they want to make sure you see them, that you know they're claiming their space. Jude, those parts aren't for girls like us. What do you mean? They're the type of girls that design, we're the type of girls that design the sets, that stay backstage. We're the girls who glow in the spot. We're not the girls who glow in the spotlight. I take another bite of the soup and it tastes like home. It tastes like the future, but I want to be, I say. She gives me a look, not the look. It is a look that I have never seen before. She is seeing me differently. She is seeing me. Chapter eight. From the moment I heard Ms. Bloom say that for the tryout we would need a monologue and a song, I knew what song I would sing. Some of my strongest memories of my brother are him standing up on the couch, belting out the words to Whitney Houston's I Will Always Love You. While Fatima and I ate our astronier and sang along with him, our mouths full of food and laughter and love. I practice my singing in the upstairs room when Mama is at the mosque or when she is downstairs pestering Uncle Mason about why the thermostat never stays at the temperature at which she set it. Some of the first English words I ever learned were from I will always love you. Issa would hop from couch cushion to couch cushion, singing the chorus, declaring his undying love, his smile so bright it made us squint. Now when I sing the song, I see the ghosts of all the days my brother has been missing line up in front of me. I stare them down as I sing as loud as I can about the strength of my love. It is a hard song to sing without the music to accompany it. I know I should choose something else, something easier, but my heart won't let me. When I sing it alone in the upstairs room, staring at those old plaster beige walls that are becoming more and more familiar, I do not feel like I am singing it alone. I hear my brother's voice in my head, filling in the melody. Chapter 9 It takes me a long time to choose my monologue. Aunt Michelle watches all my favorite movies with me, and Sarah watches too. She won't tell either of us what monologue she has chosen, and sometimes I wonder if that is because she is scared that I might steal it, which would mean she is nervous about me trying out, and not because she thinks it will be embarrassing, but because she is worried I might be good. This is probably not true, but I like to tell myself it anyway. In all my favorite movies, the actresses speak fast, and people speak right back to them, no pauses. It is hard to find a monologue. It is hard to find a place where my favorite actresses are allowed to speak without a man interrupting them before their full thought has been spoken. But finally, I pick one. It comes from Notting Hill, which is not my favorite Julia Roberts movie, but it is one of Fatima's because it is more dramatic and romantic than it is funny. I picked the part where the, her character is explaining that her life has not been as charmed as everyone at the dinner party thinks it has been. I have never been a famous actress with the seemingly glamorous life that people on the outside think is perfect, but I have lived a life that people don't quite understand in a place that lots of people, I am learning, don't understand at all. I lean into that feeling of insecurity but also of the boldness of surprising people. 
It is not lost on me that in my monologue, I am pretending to be a famous actress. I am pretending to be grown up. I am pretending. I practice the English words in the mirror. I watch the scene over and over and over and over again. I try to make my mouth move just like Julia Roberts does. My big mouth, my mouth that I sometimes like to think looks like Julia Roberts. My mouth that sometimes says things that surprise me that surprise others. Every time I practice, I think about how wonderful it feels to speak for two whole minutes with no fear of being interrupted, with no one saying sketty. Just me and my big mouth, speaking, being heard. Chapter 10. The day before my tryout, I decide to write to Fatima again. She has not answered a single letter of mine, which would make me angry if I let myself think about it too much. So I don't. I wrestle around in the room I share with Mama, looking for my pencils and paper, looking for stamps and envelopes. It's during this wrestling I find the stack of envelopes barely hidden under the bed, as if whoever stashed them there didn't want them to be found, but didn't make too much effort to disguise their existence. I recognize the handwriting immediately. It is poised and neat because I am confident in the Arabic alphabet, unlike my shaky form when it comes to English letters. The envelopes are bound together with the silk ribbon, the kind Mama uses to tie back her hair. And a thought springs into my head. I try to push it away, but it keeps growing and growing. I race downstairs and find Mama in the chair in the living room near the big window, where she often sits during the day looking out the window, looking like she is waiting for something. I hold the envelopes out to her, and even though I can see her swollen belly under the cream-colored blanket she has wrapped around herself, I cannot tame my anger. You said you sent them, I say as tears run down my face. You promised! She pulls me down beside her, but I continue to hold out the envelopes. They hover in the air like a question mark. Will you sing your song for me? Hearing my mama say that catches me off guard because it means she knows. She knows about the song, which means she knows about the tryout, which means she knows I didn't tell her. And this is so, so surprising that I almost don't notice that mama made this declaration, this request in English. You know about the tryout, I say in English as well. Arf, she says. She holds me close and I feel each pulse of her stomach, small promises of what is to come. Mama is wearing a cozy sweater and cotton pants that are stretchy but elegant. I have never seen her wear a sweater or pants and I know Aunt Michelle must have bought them for her. And that's when I realize America has also changed Mama. I just haven't been paying close attention. Why, I want to know, why didn't you send the letters? Why didn't you confront me about the play? Why does our family keep so many secrets? She strokes the back of my head like she used to do when I was little and how I know she will do to my baby sister once she is old enough to sit. She tells me that Auntie Amal and Fatima were forced to move from our town because Fatima's Baba lost his job. Business is bad, she says, and I see so much sadness in her eyes. People are scrambling for jobs. Where did they go? I ask. Lebanon. There is not much there, but people say it is doing better than other places. Other places being our city. She has not heard from Auntie Amal since they moved. She does not know if they are okay, but she is choosing to believe that they are, because Allah would want us to have faith. I didn't want you to worry. You are too young to carry so much worry. I know she is thinking of Isa and how our worry about him is so big, it is eating us both up inside. I know she is trying to tell me that she didn't think I could handle any more worry on top of that, but I am trying to show her that here in America, I am growing up. She pulls me even closer to her, which I know is her way of asking me why. It is her turn to ask me about my secrets. 
secrets. I didn't want you to worry, I say, half joking, half serious. She laughs a little and kisses the top of my head. Will you sing your song for me? She asks again. I begin the song slowly. It feels so strange to sing, strange to sing those words aloud. Here, in this chair, in America, with Mama, so far away from Issa. She must feel it too because I sense the recognition and the way her body curls around mine. Like it isn't only holding me, but it's also holding a memory. Chapter 11. On the day of the tryouts, there are so many people in the auditorium, and all of them have bracing hearts and sweaty palms. There is enough energy in here to power a train, an airplane, a small country. Layla has come with me, even though she is not trying out. You don't have to do this, she says. She is more nervous than I am. And she doesn't even have to get up on that big stage with the blinding lights. Maybe that is why she is more nervous than me, because she is the kind of person who does not want to stand under a blinding light. I sometimes wish I was like that, that I was, that I was happy to blend in, fade into the background. I sometimes worry that there is something wrong with me that I so badly want to know that other people see me. But then I think about all the other people, all the other people who are in this room right now for the exact same reason and realize my want, my dream is as big and real and valid as theirs. I spot Sarah in the auditorium and Harper Sloan Mina sitting a few rows ahead of us. They seem nervous too, grasping at each other's arms, bumping elbows for luck. One by one, we walk onto the stage, we recite our monologue, we sing our song. One by one, we are told thank you and dismissed off stage. When Mrs. Bloom calls my name, I can tell that she knows how to pronounce my first name, but is unsure what to do with my last. She skips over my last name, gargling all the letters together, making a mess of the name that is mine, Baba's, Issa's, and will be my baby sister's. And for a moment, my nerves turn from anxious to angry, from nervous to defiant. I walk out onto the stage and do not squint in the bright light, but instead stare right back at it. I am going to give her, give everyone, a reason to know how to say my name, my full name. I open my mouth and start Mama does not ask about it, but when I unpack those scarves I buried in my suitcase, she smiles, tears in her eyes. I pick a scarf that is turquoise, the color of the sea in the summer, when the sun hits it at the right angle. Mama and I fold the square scarf into a triangle, and Mama helps me drape it onto my head, crossing the corners of it around my neck, and gently pinning the tails of the scarf in place. We stand together in front of the mirror to admire the result. My face looks older, different. Maybe it is a trick of the light. Maybe it is the beautiful scarf. But I feel like I look wiser, like someone I would ask for advice, not someone asking for it. You are a woman, Jude, Mama says, her voice equal parts awe and admiration. I am looking into the mirror and at the image of me that I do not recognize. A stranger who I will get to know. A stranger who I am excited to meet. All right, you all, make sure you join us next week for part five. Thanks for listening.